they, they do that sometimes, I don't know. Did I do it right? Hello, uh, my name is Jordan Kahn. I'm the chef owner of Vespertine, Meteora, and Destroyer. Today we will be making Cuban sandwich, or Cubanos as they're known. This is uh, a deeply nostalgic flavor memory for me uh, as growing up in a Cuban household. So we felt, felt that it would be appropriate for us to kind of show you some of our interpretations of how to make a, a traditional Cubano. It literally smells like my grandmother's house already. This is wild. First thing we're gonna do is introduce uh, some of the ingredients that we'll be working with. Um, traditionally, uh, cubanos are made with something called pernil, which is a roasted Cuban pork, typically done with the shoulder, but uh, can be done with a few parts of the animal. We've chosen pork belly as kind of a clever nod to uh, the Chinese influence that exists in Cuba. What we want to do is kind of make more of a, a Cantonese style pork belly with very crispy skin, but using obviously Cuban flavors, and this will be the base for what we eventually slice and make its way into the, uh, into the sandwich. So the first thing we're gonna do is brine this. So we just have a boneless belly here, but very important, is the skin is still on. First thing we'll do is we'll take salt, uh, black pepper, cumin, uh, bay leaf, uh, and uh, some heirloom garlic. We always use heirloom garlic because um, it not only tastes better, but also does not linger on you long after you eat it. My grandmother never made Cuban sandwiches. They would take us on trips uh, to Miami a few times a year to see our family. Cuban sandwiches are not really made in the house. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, a restaurant thing. They actually were invented in Florida. Um, and there's a kind of a, a big dispute whether or not they originated in Tampa or Miami or Key West. I'll let those people continue their their fight. I'm from Savannah, Georgia, so there was really truly no Cuban enclave there whatsoever, except for our, my grandmother's house and our house. Um, so going to Miami was very, I think, nourishing for the family because there was just a whole culture there. And so we could have all of the things that we would see only exist in my grandmother's house. Like my grandfather famously, when they got their house, Cuban ingredients were not available, so they had to grow all of them. Uh, so a big backyard filled with sour orange trees. Um, and my grandfather was such a kind, like generous person. Whenever he would have oranges, he would all like give them to the neighbors. And I guess the story goes is like, they were all very, they all knew how kind my grandfather was. So they were always very like welcome. He's like, oh, thank you so much, Francisco. And they didn't want to hurt his feelings. But one day my grandmother saw some of the neighbors like throwing the oranges out in the dumpster because they didn't know what sour oranges were. They were like, God, this guy has the worst oranges. And they would go and eat them and they, they would think that they were so, so gross. But of course, they're not meant for, for eating outright. They're meant for cooking. So um, a few other like, interesting things that I had never seen before outside of my grandfather's garden until recently when we started growing them ourselves. This is um, something called Cuban oregano. It's actually a very succulent like um, leaf. It has a kind of a soft furriness to it and a snap and a juiciness. Um, has a large uh, amount of uh, oregano essential oil but it also has kind of a few other tertiary notes to it which make it kind of its own flavor. These are burro bananas. We got them green to make our mariquitas. It's an heirloom uh, banana. This is our mame. Uh, it's, a, it's a variety of sapote. It's my mom's favorite fruit. Deep orange on the inside. They have no acid whatsoever. It's all custard. Uh, we're gonna make a, a milkshake with that. And instead of using ice cream, we're essentially gonna use the flesh of the mame. The flavor itself is very mild. Uh, it has some umami notes and a bit of like kind of a slight vanilla quality to it. But it has the texture is extraordinary. It's like eating very, very dense custard. So rather than pulling for the white jar of ice cream powder, you blend in uh, some mame and it has the most beautiful silky texture, uh, but doesn't have any gums in it. So that's not a flavor inhibitor. And then of course some Habaneros. Cuban cuisine is not spicy at all, but they would always have like little jars of hot sauce on the table. So my grandfather really likes spicy food. So we're gonna make ours a little bit spicy. Getting back to the pork. So we're essentially just boiling all of these ingredients. We're using half the amount of water in the brine. And then the other half is gonna come in the form of ice. This makes it so that we can boil everything, but we can chill it down really quickly. Otherwise, if we were to use 100% water, we would have to wait for this to cool for hours. So this is just sort of a, a quick, instant uh, chill. So 
So this is gonna get brined for 12 hours. If you don't have space in your refrigerator, you could certainly use a cooler. And there's enough ice still left in here where to actually keep it for 12 hours perfectly cold on the counter, just in an insulated cooler. Once your pork is sufficiently brined, you'll just want to dry it. And then we're going to make some incisions into the skin. But essentially the idea here is we want to perforate the skin so that as it cooks, it gives it space to expand. And this will make our skin not only crispy, but also it will puff quite a bit. The smaller we make these cuts, the more the better the texture will result in. It'll give more air, more space to expand. And so it'll create a nice, brittle, crisp skin. We don't go too deep, we don't hit the meat, we just score just the skin. It's gotta live back. Yeah. This is the pork that we have brined and scored. This has been brined for 12 hours. We scored the skin on this nicely. And then the next thing we're gonna do is make a marinade. And we're gonna toast the spices first. We're gonna then take this and we're gonna apply it to the bottom side of this. Next thing we're gonna do is then flip this guy over carefully. So we have the marinade on the bottom. We're then gonna start creating a little package. We're gonna kind of fold the edges so that we can develop kind of sturdy walls. So we're essentially doing two cooking processes at once. So one of the process that we're doing is kind of creating a, a, almost a form of a braise in the bottom side of this, but by leaving the top open, we're also allowing dry heat roast. So as this cooks, this will start to dry out. Uh, this will start to make the skin crispy, but it protects what's inside uh, the belly underneath so that that can get nice and tender. The other thing that, this is the reason why this is important, is we're actually going to cover top of this skin with salt. And it's gonna prevent the salt from getting into the flesh side, which will immediately absorb it. The skin will kind of not absorb too much salt, just enough to season it, but also to dry it out. And then we're gonna bake this for about one to two hours, depending on your oven's uh, efficiency. Um, we'll pull it out, we'll let it cool a bit. We're gonna brush all the salt off, still keeping the foil on the sides to protect it. And then afterwards, we're gonna put it back in the oven under the broiler setting, and we're gonna puff and crispy up this skin. While that's doing its thing, we can actually make um, something that is not traditional at all. It's a vinaigrette that we'll use as actually kind of a sauce for this. All right, so you can see our score has created these tiny little crispy nuggets. And then the sides, it's fully tender. Next, we'll get into a sandwich assembly. We would always sort of say, especially in the restaurants, if we were making a sandwich, always make it as if you are making it for yourself after work. You go all the way to the edges because that first bite is so important. So we're gonna take a little bit of the marinade from the pork belly. And we're just gonna put a very light coating on this side of the bread. This is also not traditional.
inside of your foil some wonderful little gifts that you need to make sure that you don't get rid of, which is all of this pork fat that is now infused. We're gonna do a little dip. We slice it upside down. It'll make it a little bit easier to get through cleanly. And then a second layer to glue them in. We're gonna take our pork fat olive oil, make sure that came from the rendered. And we're gonna sog out this guy a little bit. Cuban sandwiches, just like American sandwiches, oftentimes are served with chips. In this case, because we're um, Cuban influenced, we're gonna be using bananas. These are green. Um, so their, their starches have not converted to sugar yet. They're nice and hard. These are uh, burro bananas, it's an heirloom. Uh, you can also use uh, plantains um, as well, which are more traditional, but we like the flavor of the burros a lot, so. We'll start it a little bit higher, uh, and then as it cooks, we'll kind of lower the temp a bit to let them get fully crisp. We're also gonna make a milkshake, or a licuado, or a batido, out of this fruit, which is called mame. It's quite an unusual fruit for Americans. Um, it's, it's deeply sweet, custardy, kind of has a vanilla-like flavor. Big seed in the center. And this seed is very delicious to use. Um, Tastes like uh, almonds. Our mariquitas are basically have stopped moving, so we're going to fish these guys out. First thing we'll do is we'll just add a little bit of butter to this. Let me see how hot this is. Oh, it's pretty perfect. This is a little uh, influence that, that we apply that's uh, atypical. These sandwiches are also great because you can build them way ahead of time and wrap them in plastic wrap keep them in the fridge. All you need to do when it's time to serve them is just press them, leave them in the press, takes about five to 10 minutes and then you're good to go. I think it's important to make sure to go dark enough. You don't want it to be too light. Like if we were to look here, it's a nice golden brown. We want most of this to match kind of that texture. Mm -hmm. 